Hello, I'm Ed Needham, editor of the fabulous literary magazine Strong Words, and this is my podcast, The Five Rules of Writing. In each episode, I speak to a most excellent writer in a particular genre about how they do it. And if you'd like to know more about Strong Words, and specifically how to subscribe, go to www.strong-words.co.uk and you'll be whisked straight to the website. Hello, and welcome to the Five Rules of Writing, brought to you by Strong Words magazine. If you'd like to find out more about Strong Words and think you'd like to subscribe, take a look at the website. That's strongwords.co.uk, so strong-words.co.uk. Don't forget the hyphen. This is a podcast where I talk to writers about the five things they know to be true in writing, whatever it is that they write for a living. So whether they spend their days writing the history of the Isle of Wight or a book of poetry that takes 190 million years to read, as the new Strong Words reports one poet having done, there are some aspects of their work that are absolutely non-negotiable. Now, today my guest is an author whose latest book is uh, set in the very creepy county of Norfolk. It's called The Marsh House, and it's a rather spooky story set in the early 60s. And it tells of a single mother arriving at a cottage just before Christmas with a small daughter and a dog. She is expecting a rather warm and welcoming sanctuary, and she finds it is anything but. She has no choice, though, and so she finds herself spending a very cold and unsettling Christmas there as the temperature plummets towards one of the coldest winters on record. And just about the only thing to do is rummage in the loft, where she finds the notebooks of a previous resident, a teenage girl in the 1930s, which are also shared rather creepily with the reader. The major component of this very creepy holiday is the Norfolk countryside, especially the marsh that lies between the cottage and the sea, and from which you can hear the ghost of a girl who was out cockling and was caught by the tide, crying above the wind. So here to share her five rules of writing about how to use the countryside to best unsettle your readers, I'd like to welcome the most excellent Zoe Somerville. Zoe, Thank how you. are you? Thank uh, you. That was a wonderful introduction. I love the way you described the book. Well, it's a tremendous book, and I really enjoyed it. But what prom- what what prompted you to make remotest, chilliest Norfolk such an inhospitable setting for your new book? Yeah, I mean, I think ghostly, eerie stories need to be set somewhere pretty inhospitable because you know those are the places that actually are genuinely creepy in in, in actual life, let alone in a, in a story where it's all heightened. Um, but actually, why it's specifically there is because. I'm from Norfolk and my first novel was set there in um, the town of Wells, which is further along the coast and is less spooky, but still on the marsh. And while I was there researching that book and then visiting for, you know, signing books and things like that. um, But actually, while I was researching it, I also came across, I was reminded of really, these stories of M.R. James, who you will have probably heard of. Mm -hmm. And in particular, A Warning to the Curious, um, which is um, one that was made into a brilliantly creepy film in the 70s. And um, I think it might have been a BBC film or something like that, I can't remember now. But it's set around there. And it's the idea of the fog coming in from the sea and the fact that the marsh is an unstable place. It's not quite land and it's not quite sea. It is neither one thing nor the other and is therefore extremely treacherous, especially with the tides as well. And I thought this, I have to write a ghost story here. Or a story that is, it's not necessarily exactly a traditional ghost story, but it's certainly um, um, creepy, eerie, Designed yes. to be unsettling, like you say. Yes. Yeah. Now you so you say you're from Norfolk, and Norfolk yes. seems like um, a, it gives me the impression of being quite a sort of haunted sort of county. Have yes. you have you ever had a haunted experience in Norfolk? Oh, I wish. No, gosh, I spent my entire childhood desperate for one. <laughs> I I just loved ghost stories and things like that. No, I mean to be honest, I um I I, I would love to have one, but no, Ed, I'm afraid to say I have I I this is I'm dreading this question from you know people. <laughs> have you had a ghost? No, I haven't. Um, I just 
I'd like to imagine them. But actually, when I was growing up, I spent my dad's really into history. We used to spend a lot of time going around to old ruins, um, you know, basically the past. He loved the past and therefore that transited to me. And that's the idea of old things seeping through into the present that is often really creepy. Right. And so, I mean, Norfolk's a really ancient, ancient place, like all of Britain is, I suppose. But we all, we know it has... And it ha- it's quite empty. You know, it's a big county, not a lot of cities. I mean, I'm from the city, actually. I'm from Norwich. But the countryside is actually not overpopulated. So it can be quite empty. Mm. It's I quite think- soggy as well, isn't it? Yes, it's very quite- wet, very wet. soggy, very flat, of course. Yes, um, with the broads and yes. uh, all that sort of inland sort of marshland that was drained yes. and yes. then... Um, you know, the, uh, the the tide going out for miles yeah. and coming in again. Yeah, the beaches are huge. And actually that can be quite disorienting as well because you don't know, um, and, and you often think that something is safe and it's not because, mm. you know, you get these sort of, um, oh, I've forgotten what they're called, but that you get these spits, that's right, spits of um, sand that you think are, are solid, but then the tide will come in and then you'll, you can be cut off. And that does sometimes right. happen around there. Um, and it's muddy, as well, very muddy, and the mud can be quite dangerous. Actually, mm. if um, you get it, time it wrong, and I mean, did right. you did you did you do some research into this? Did you get out onto the marshes yes. and, and put yourself in danger? Yeah, well, I wouldn't say put myself in danger, but I did. I did um, a walk that was. I went. I walked along. I mean, I you know specifically different villages and stuff, but I walked. Um, so there's a coastal path there. And I walked along the coastal path, but then I went off the coastal path, which was probably quite ill-advised. Mm. And I went um, over the particular marsh where this is set. It is a specific one. I mean, obviously, I include bits from other bits of the marsh, but yeah. And I went right into it and I realised I had to do that because by doing that, I realised the exact topography, I suppose, of, of right. the marsh itself. And then things like the colour of the mud, which is different at different places, and the grasses and the way the little creeks go and, and things like that, because I don't live there. I needed to do that, yeah. From Strong Words magazine, these are the five rules of writing. Right. OK, well, let's have a look at your five rules. Anyway, Zoe, I mean, yeah. these are excellent rules. If anyone is planning to write a novel <laughs> with some unsettling countryside or you're writing a novel and, you're, and your countryside isn't unsettling enough. These are <laughs> these are of great practical value, I think. So listen hard. Uh, anyway, your first rule, you say choose a place that is on the edge of somewhere. For example, a beach, a marsh, a deserted suburb with encroaching wi- wildness or a wood on the edge of a village. These are yeah. sometimes called liminal spaces or borderlands. Now, already I can start to feel shivers. Why should this combination be so reliably creepy? Do you think? It's a really good question. Um, I think because um, huh, they are not quite known. So um, a city is full of people, isn't it? And there's usually noise and sound, and they're, and they're, they're, but they're known sounds, they're known, they're known noises. Um, suburbs are interesting places because, I mean, I don't, I, I haven't got a suburb here, but these are quite, they're quite good locations, I think, because they can be quite empty. And for me, it's a certain amount of emptiness that mm. leads to creepiness, essentially. And actually suburbs, um, or I'm saying that, or villages, something like that that's got the kind of coziness of um the known and then but to be near something like say for example a wood a wood at the end of a lane or a wood at the end of a village but you're you're close there then to the wild aren't you and it's the potential for the wild to encroach on the known that I think gives the reader a feeling of that something bad could happen yes I suppose. yes and, Sorry, go that ahead. That makes sense. Oh, well, I was just going to say, I, I mean, I haven't got woods here, but woods are another wonderful location <laughs> for creepy books because woods are, again, they are, they can be comforting in certain lights when there's people around you and then suddenly they're not. And suddenly you don't know where you've got to. And that's the other thing I was going to say. Edgelands can be places where things change very quickly. So mm. wood, um, 
you can suddenly get lost, can't you? Because you've lost your place. You don't quite know where you are. And the same with beaches, actually. And it sounds odd because you think, oh, a beach is just a bit of sand in between some something and something else. But actually, beaches are treacherous places because I was saying about the tides. But equally, they can be, especially the ones in Norfolk, they are big often mm. and um they have different aspects to them um i'm going to come to this but the weather can change and therefore you can, you may get disoriented you may not quite know exactly where you are I think. yes that's a really good point actually because i was just thinking it's a thing about the unknown but it's not just the unknown is it it's a you can, it's, a, it's the potential of getting lost as well which is uh which is, yes, I, I I hadn't considered. I was thinking about you know how just how different it, it is the countryside and the uh, is from the city because my I grew up in the countryside. So I'm I'm familiar with its sort of emptiness and its moonlight yeah. and all these kind of things and shadows and that. But uh, my daughter uh, has grown up in the city, and we were talking about this the other day. And even though she lives in a part of the London which can be quite lively at times, you know, she had to call the police mm-hmm. the other day because of a fight in the street or something. Oh gosh! And uh, you know, so there's so there's genuine yeah. sort of sense of possibility of danger uh whereas we were talking about the country she said i could never live in the country you know it's just too terrifying even though you know the chance yeah. of having to call the police to break up a fight there very low <laughs> but it, it's slim. the emptiness of it that's mm. that that's the bit that people are find unsettling because the lack of human humanity around you isn't it and the idea that you could you are much smaller in it i suppose because um, there, there are fewer of you um, and the darkness is closer, I think, yes. as well. There's less light. I've just been thinking, do you know what? I have, I didn't write that as part of the rules, but actually thinking about it, actually that's part of it too, isn't it? It's the lack of um, street lighting and um, uh, car lights and all the, 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 the things that we take for granted are not there and there's just more darkness, more of actual nature itself to to potentially trip you up potentially yes you know. yes that's really yeah. good. i mean just like like you were t- talking about you know walking off the marsh path earlier on yeah. you know, if, if uh, anybody who's done a walk in the woods or whatever knows you know if, you're, yeah. if you if you take a wrong turn you can yeah. really, <laughs> exactly yeah, you've got no actually, idea where you are all of a sudden there, there are stories and actually i did i nearly did actually include an entire folk tale uh in my book uh, it ended up not but it kind of informed it really about a man that gets lost on the marsh and it, you know that really in, informed quite a bit of what i was writing mm. because he literally does get lost and caught by these folkloric creatures that are on the marsh and things like that because but genuinely this is based in the sense you know, in a kind of reality, I suppose, isn't it? That it is easier to get lost right? Um, yes. somewhere where you don't understand the markers. And especially if you're an outsider in it. Yes. Um, again, that's another, <laughs> maybe I should have put that as a rule. You need to be an outsider yeah. in the countryside as well. Although uh, I do have to say with, with being lost, I always feel on the underground in London, at least yeah, that's true. 25% of the people down there at any one time are lost. You know, they yeah, they've got no idea, but it doesn't matter down there, does it? Because you can always find a sign or someone to tell you where to go, okay. and hopefully they'll tell you where. Yeah. Right. Or they'll I know be like me and, and try and be helpful, but send you in completely the wrong direction. Oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but I feel like in the, there's, a there's I mean, obviously, you know, there is potential for creepiness in a city. I mean, yes. I, no denying yes. it. But I've always felt like I'm actually, perhaps it's because I am a city person, because I am originally a city person, that I find the countryside inherently creepy you know maybe that's what it is and so the city person doesn't have what they're used to around them and therefore they are more likely to be ill at ease okay so we've got our borderlands yeah now your next uh, rule your second rule you say insert figures into the space that seems strange (laughs) someone who appears and disappears someone who asks odd questions or who seem like one thing then become something else. Isolation is key in creating an atmosphere of unease and a few figures can increase the impression of abandonment in an otherwise deserted place. So how, which is obviously fabulous, you know, a, a, a shadowy weirdo Ooh. turning up. <laughs> Weirdos, yeah. <laughs> but how do you avoid cliche with these? Oh, things? it's tricky. Ah, oh, that's a really hard one. I know, because I think, you know, that could be quite, you know, deliverance couldn't tell let's be honest mm. somebody being a bit a bit of a local la 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 and ooh, that you need to avoid that they have to be believable and actually they may not have, I think the key would be to that they may not have first be creepy you know they, they might just be actually quite benign and it's only 
a slight hint that there is something slightly strange. So I, I, I don't, I, you know, it's not a spoiler to say that um, my character goes into a shop and then um, there's hardly anyone there, but the, the girl tells her stories, you know, tells her a story, I think, doesn't she? I can't remember. I think that's right. <laughs> and things like that. Or the girl says something about the house she's in. So there's just these little hints, that are hopefully not overdone. You know, I don't think you want them to be overly, obviously, I don't know, mad or something. That's 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 just unhelpful. I, you know, that the reader will be sighing. Oh no, you know. So I think it's a fine line, isn't it? But yeah. So I suppose they just need to be seeming to be perfectly fine, and yet something is slightly wrong. Right. Something is slightly off. Whatever it is, it could be a little hint of that something in the place is strange, um, or they are. They are not acting entirely as you might expect, I suppose. Yes. And I read a piece in the paper at the weekend about a man who is the last resident of a remote village in Italy. And oh, he wow. lives in a ramshackle house in a hamlet deep in the countryside. There's no electricity, no running water. Wow. So he feels like one of these very sort of lonely, slightly odd figures. But he couldn't be happier. You yeah. Know, and tourists come and visit him and give him presents. He chats to the great life. So it's kind of wrong to assume that just because someone is alone yes. in nowhere, that they're thinking yeah. dark thoughts. And yeah, no, things. quite. And actually, they could just be a very, um, you know, a, a very a kind of hermit. But that that's a choice for some people, isn't it? No, that's true, actually. And I think um, the character, yes, I, I hope that comes across a little bit in my book, actually, that sometimes the characters... Um, who seem threatening are not, they're actually benign. Um, and that's important, I think. You're right. To yeah. upend that, that cliche a little bit. Yes. And yeah. did and but just coming back to the cliche, did you find that there were more rustics in Norfolk than <laughs> Oh gosh, that's a good question. I mean, I would say that um do you know, I I don't dare, I wouldn't like to say that. I would say there's there's a bit of um I sometimes feel as if Norfolk can feel a little cut off. It's a little bit like Cornwall in that respect. It's at the edge of the country. Yes. You can't go, you don't go through it to go anywhere. So you have to make an effort to go there. And I think because, of, and also it's quite popular with tourists. And mm. I think because of that, there's a certain insularity sometimes um, uh, to places. And that is be partly because they are, they've been there for a long time and, you know, and, and the way their ways are their ways. Um, so that 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 is perhaps true, but I've I've actually been I've always had lovely lovely you know welcomes wherever I've been. In okay. So no, no, everyone's <laughs> been really friendly and nice. <laughs> Good. Okay. Now then, your rule, your third rule. So we've got yeah. our borderland. We've got our strange, <laughs> but not individual, <laughs> but not but not rustic, uh, not cliche. And uh, so your third rule, you say, include hints of a past that may reemerge, such as a crumbling down cottage ancient ruins, an old church, or a found object. Now, I, re I really feel we should be playing sort of spooky music by now. <laughs> I know. But, but when you were describing the cottage in your book, um, yeah. which is a very chilly and disappointing place for your character, <laughs> Mallory, to arrive at, how, yeah. did you, how did you summon this, uh, this very dismal cottage up? But you know, I have no idea. That's just, later. That just came from my imagination. I just imagined it. I, I also think uh, it's worth remembering that um, the book is set in the early sixties, and um, I mean, I was born in the seventies, and that was, uh, you know, quite a long time after this book is set. But you know, things houses oft, still often didn't have electricity sometimes, um, mm -hmm. and and were off grid and things. That was much more common then, or didn't have gas central heating and you know mod cons. And actually, that it was much more common in places um, on the edge of place, especially to not be that welcoming, to not be well, to to not have all the mod cons that we would expect now. And so I think in the early sixties, it wouldn't have been that uncommon actually mm -hmm. uh, for somewhere in the countryside to be like that. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I once went to stay in a house in France for Christmas and in, in the summer, I'm sure it's fabulous, but in the winter, yeah. you know, when we arrived, it, it literally had water running down the stairs. Oh, God. You know, it was so damp. And I really feel, yeah. you know, by arriving out of season, you know, when no one is supposed to be there, yes. I feel it's almost as though I, I saw something I wasn't supposed to see. You know, it's as though, you know, buildings can take on this sort of amazing sort of individual character, can't they? That, that yeah, I love that's a brilliant way. That's really interesting. I think if we all went to 
the yeah I did spend some Christmases in a cottage not in Norfolk actually in Cornwall this is but in the middle of nowhere and um yeah similar really cold and really quite bleak actually in some ways Mm. and I think that's um what you get I mean possibly less so now (laughs) again we live in a world where you know everything's Airbnb doesn't it and sort of you know done up and sold on at great cost but um I I think you're right I think houses absolutely can take on a different character and and especially as you say in the winter it's much easier for it to it to seem unwelcoming then definitely Right. And then just coming back to this sort of this thing of the past that, oh, yeah. can, uh, in, you know, suddenly poke its nose in. Uh, what are the how does the, what's the best way to do that? Do you think? How do you make that happen? Oh, my goodness. I mean, that could be anything. I just I suppose for me, I wanted to tap in to this sort of underbelly of um, folk superstition. Mm. And that's sort of what I'm trying to get at in the book um and that's sort of the idea that that's still there and can rise to the surface at any time and so that's that's the sort of objects that I or past that I'm getting at and I suppose also the house itself um and the house itself is fairly old as well I think also a lot of really really good eerie books um have hints often of say Britain's ancient past um, so I, I'm thinking of something like Sarah Moss's uh, Ghost Wall. I don't know if you've read that. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, and things like that. And um, or Mr. James's. Um, I can't remember what it is now. Is it a chalice or something that he I finds? Or some East Anglian king. Um, but there's loads of examples of this. Churches, I think, are inherently ghostly because of course they are. You know, often sites of graves as well. Mm. But equally, they have huge amounts of history in them so it's about the idea of the history just being there under the surface and who who knows what's um what could come back so I don't have you know a ghost of an ancient um person in my book at all but it's this idea that the past is very close to us and and you could do that in so many ways um there are you know uh, anything almost um that you know you could find something I think you know things like witches marks are uh, a bit of a, a, a classic one things a mark even on the house that gives a sign of what was here before that's a, I mean houses buildings um yeah there's so many options but yes. I feel like the past the past sort of is all around us here and I think that's something that um you know it, it has the potential for hauntings Yes. I mean, it's into, there's a whole variety of things there, aren't there? Because uh, Yes, I mean, too many, with, probably. Well, with no, but I think with things like folklore, you know, they do have a sort of, they can have a sort of creepy aura, but they don't really bother people. I mean, you know, yeah. they don't really bother people in real life, do they? No. Where, where it's very much a literary thing rather than a real thing. Whereas yes, that's true. You know, finding something like a witch's mark on your house, I've got no idea what it might be, but that sounds absolutely terrifying, you know. And yes, it would be, I think. Yeah, no. And you yeah. can, I mean... Or, I mean, people have found all kinds of things in, in those sort of walls of houses that that um, that give hints of what's been there before, you know, like, mm. um, uh, yeah, it's sort of, I don't know, perhaps an old book or an old, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, but something to ward a witch's um, a potion that we might ward off witches. That's very common. Or not yes, there's lots of superstitions, now, but... aren't there? Builders' yeah. superstitions about putting yeah. things in walls. That's a good That's a good one. Yeah. Okay, now then your fourth rule, play with weather. You say, oh. you say I use snow, but any kind of extreme <laughs> weather, such as storms or a heat wave, are also very effective at altering the landscape dramatically, dangerously, and in a disorientating way. It can also reflect characters' state of mind. Similarly, the personification of the environment can give the impression that the landscape itself is malign. Now, this is, uh, you know, we're, we're really getting out there now. You know, <laughs> it would it would feel like it'd be very, very easy to be clumsy with. As oh, well, yeah. You know, have- I was going to say, that's a real classic. I mean, you may have noticed probably the way that I've written some of these rules. I'm an English teacher. <laughs> And this is the sort of thing you teach the kids, but it's really easy to get it wrong. And I yeah. suppose, but it is, um, it is, I do do it here. You know, I think the thing is, I gave myself a um, a way of doing it by setting it at a real time. And I think, you know, there are, you know, we do have, and Britain is generally a very safe place to be. 
However, we do have extremes of weather and they are increasingly so, of course. So um, there are plenty of opportunities, I'd say, um, to do this. Um, storms are a particularly good time for, um, you know, a writer to, to ramp up the tension. But of course, you know, as you say, it can be really quite overdone. But it's also if it's done well in a believable way, then it feels threatening. Snow is, can feel threatening because it is genuinely dangerous and yeah. isolating can cut off villages, as we'll know from a you know a few years ago. Um, the beast from the east, you know, it literally can make people, you know, isolate people and in pubs, but not so bad, um, or wherever, or in their car or something like that. And that is in itself a dangerous thing to, you know, situation yes, to be in. Quite, quite. And anything and that's dangerous is potentially creepy as well yes uh, i think yes i mean are there, are there weather cliches though that yeah. sort of drive you mad you know that well, make you throw books in the bin yeah well i suppose if it's something's rain if it's raining and that therefore they're miserable that's a bit boring isn't it yeah it doesn't really uh, you know you have to be a little careful and it, you can get a bit carried away um yeah. you know um yeah i it's very yeah and they're supposed in the and actually i do find the opposite of that to be quite interesting heat equaling um you know passion doesn't necessarily it can also equal um people becoming very frustrated and, mm. and hot and bothered and it can also be can that can be used in a really creepy way too i think yes. um but it's just it's about you know perhaps thinking of different things that can happen to the characters because of it rather than it being in itself i don't know yeah okay good so we've got uh, we've got uh, <laughs> We've got our borderlands. We've got uh, our um, creepy individual. We've got our uh, <laughs> hints of the past re-emerging and the weather going slightly berserk. And <laughs> fifth rule, you say use foreshadowing to create the uh, sense that the countryside is not a safe place. For example, through unexplained deaths or hurts, a creeping feeling that all is not right in this place. That's <laughs> fabulous. So tell our listeners the sort of creepy foreshadowing they can expect in the Marsh House. Oh, yeah. Well, it opens with um, a kind of mini car crash, really, what we'd call a prank. And the car, the car sort of bangs into a hedge. And I think that was very deliberate because, you know, you want the reader to feel disoriented straight away. Mm. And, I, and I think... Um, it's a sign that um, possibly this isn't the safest place for them to be in. This isn't the the ideal place. That something's perhaps it could be, of course, that, that there's something wrong with the driver rather than the landscape. But we don't know for sure. Mm. And I think that's that sense of unknown is really important. I don't think I've said this at any point, but at, at any point, it should not be entirely clear to the reader what is going on well not that they don't shouldn't know what's going on but they shouldn't necessarily think oh yeah well this is a ghost or this is that this is that I think it's got to be un a bit unclear because otherwise it's too obvious isn't it yes. so um less satisfying and I think it's more actually um interesting if we aren't sure so that is an example of that so I, there's a prang in the car we has she hit an animal has she not we're not sure um, and then later on, there's um, illness. There's um, something happens with an animal mm. um, and things like that. <laughs> I can't really yeah. say too many. And, when, and, and as you sort of pile these things up, yeah. you know, these little That's instances, the and there's, a, there's yeah. a thing on hanging on the wall as well, isn't there? Oh, yes, there's that. Like... Sorry. Yes, actually, I was going to mention that one. That one's quite early on. There's something hanging on the wall that is a little odd and little details like that yeah mm. um there's a sampler <laughs> so as you sort of pile these things up are you are you sort of do you feel you're later expected to provide a rationale or explanation or, or are they allowed to just re remain mysterious for all time really good question i, I think i don't give a rationale to all <laughs> of them i'm going to be honest with you because i was thinking about this but that's quite deliberate i think if you're writing a murder mystery you want to have the the ends tied up but with a story which is uh, eerie unsettling creepy whatever you want to call it I think you do it is a it is allowed to have some open-endedness because you because I think the reader will come to it with their explanation does that make sense because I think yes. towards the end um some explanations are given 
sort of. Um, well, they, they are, they are offered, if that makes sense. Alternatives are offered. And I think it's up to the reader then uh, to make up their own mind. And then they can look back at those um, scenarios and have rational responses to what they could have, what those things could have been. And it has to be possible that there's rational response, I think. But equally, there could be potentially an alternative. Right. And that's, I think, in the end, it has to be possible for it to have been either. Okay. Now then, to who do you, uh, who do you look to, Zoe, as, as the, the very finest exponent of this sort of, uh, you know, giving people the creeps by way of the British countryside? Do you know, I think Andrew Michael Hurley is one of my favourites. Mm. He's amazing. He writes mostly in the north, actually, doesn't he? Very Yorkshire, yes. Very Yorkshire, is it? Yes. I, but I love, I love his writing. He's amazing. I really like, I um, don't know if you've read Lucy McKnight Hardy. No, um, I haven't. Water I haven't. Shall Refuse Them. That's really good. She, that's a heat wave. And I, it's one of the reasons I talked about the heat wave, because I really loved what she did with that. Uh, it's about 1976, I think it is. So I really like her. I'm looking at my, I'm looking at my um, bookshelves now and I'm thinking, who do I really love? Oh, I don't know. Um, there's so many. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, I know who's really, really good. Another writer called Alice Moore. She's brilliant. Um, have you read her, any of her stuff? She writes really creepy beach related. Yes, books. I've just read The Retreat. Um, yes, me too. I thought that was really clever. Yes. Um, very spooky, very creepy about, and very, very much a book. I've only just read it too, so I didn't, I hadn't read it when I wrote the book. <laughs> See, There's I really a, liked it because of all the awful people in it. All yes, awful, that's true, yeah. actually. There was a lot of terrible people in it. That was quite funny, I thought. Yes. The other writer who I think is really good at being uh, pretty creepy is a writer called um, what's her, Amanda Mason. She wrote a really lovely book called The Wayward Girls, which is a brilliant ghost story. Again, that's Yorkshire too, actually. But, um, yeah. Oh, and I'm trying to think. No, okay. that's it. Well, that's enough <laughs> for people to be getting on with. But I just yeah, like, lots. I just like to ask you my uh, the two questions that I ask all writers. Uh, what is what do you consider the the correct number of words for a writer to write <laughs> per day? What? Oh, I have no do? idea. I would say that's very very personal, and <laughs> whatever's correct for you is the correct amount. But actually, I'll go. I'll tell you what I try to do, which is a different thing, because um, I don't think people should have a rule for that. Um, that I try when I'm writing a first draft, which is very different from anything else. I write. I try to write five thousand words a week, so it's not per day. I give myself a bit of a break because then if I don't get to a thousand in the day. Mm-hmm. I can pick it up and then okay. often I'll write more than a five five thousand yeah. right okay and the other the other question uh, which I ask everybody is uh, one I find that one of the things that uh, links pretty much all writers one of the few things that all writers have in common is that hardly any of them actually like writing where, where, <laughs> do, where do you stand on that I do I love writing I love writing I although it's painful I will you know in a sort of pathetic way I mean like you know there's worse things in the world but we all complain about it essentially but I don't think we do hate it I don't think that's truthful I think writers do like writing I think they get a huge amount of satisfaction from when they've written something but what they hate is the empty page the bit before and I think they also hate well personally I hate anyway the bit when you're having, you've got a first draft and then you're like, oh no, what am I going to do with this mess? Because it is inevitably not great. There's, I mean, unless you're a genius, like, I don't know. Oh, Shirley Jackson, she's a good writer. Uh, <laughs> somebody like that, maybe. And apparently Muriel Spark just used to write her first drafts and that was it. But yes. generally, everyone needs to edit. So Fantastic. That looks hard. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Zoe, thank you so much. I urge everybody to read... Zoe Somerville's The Marsh House immediately before you do anything else. And thank you, Zoe, so much for talking to me. Really, Thank you. From Strong Words magazine, these are the five rules of writing. 